Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to this, the second session of uh, the Board Ready Programme. Uh, my name is Declan Jackson. I'm a Director of Corporate Affairs here in Deloitte, Ireland, and um, it's my pleasure to be hosting uh, what is, I can safely say, a blockbuster panel here this morning. Um, we are joined by uh, Franz Van Dala and uh, Kate English. Um, Kate is going to talk to us first, and then Franz is going to talk to us uh, following uh, Kate's commentary. Uh, each will talk for about 20 minutes, and we do have a question and answer session available in um, uh, in the chat function. So if you would like to ask anything of Kate or Franz, or you'd like to start an argument with them or with me, <laughs> please do feel free to, uh, to um, pop in your questions there. Um, just by way of brief um, background, um, we're delighted today to be joined um, by uh, Franz Van Dala. Franz is a Belgian-born uh, diplomat. Um, he worked in a number of posts for the Belgian government, um, probably culminating uh, in his role as Perm Rep to the European Union and Ambassador to the USA. Um, uh, at the conclusion of his um, his diplomatic career, he was made a Minister of State in the Belgian government. Um, Franz advises us in Deloitte on international trade and geopolitics, and I have the pleasure of working with Franz and his team uh, in the EU Public Policy Centre uh, on behalf of the Irish firm and and. Um, and clients. So I'm really looking forward to to uh, to Franz's discussion this morning. And thank you, Franz, for joining us. Um, we're also joined by uh, Kate English. Um, for those of you, and I'm sure many of you on the call are avid listeners of radio, Kate is probably a name well known to you from yesterday's drive time. And uh, I think uh, also tomorrow's News Talk business slot, Kate, you'll probably be there as well. So Correct. We're 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 working we're working Kate hard on on the radio. Um, Kate is a Deloitte Ireland's economist, and she's a head of our real estate um, research. So it's um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to hear from Kate, and she will talk to us about some of the forces that are driving the Irish economy, and maybe some of the forces that aren't driving it as hard. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Kate to begin. So, uh, Kate, thank you very much. Good morning. And the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, a fabulous introduction, Declan. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, tw I have 20 minutes and we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to dive straight in. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at if we look at the first slide route, not going to dwell on a kind of global context and Europe and US and China and Germany too much as I often do sometimes because I think today we want to focus more on Ireland. But I still didn't want to start with at least acknowledging that global economic context because as a small open economy, Ireland is incredibly reliant on what's happening in other parts of the world. And I suppose what have we seen over the past two years and what do we continue to see in the forecasts for the next two years is that one hour global economy continues to perform better than what many people would have anticipated. And certainly when we were at that start of your high inflationary period and also the start of high interest rates beginning to feed through. Uh, but of course, what we have seen within that is quite a difference in performance across our region, our region variations. So for example, I always say the <coughs> US has been almost the shining light and the, the economy that has continued to surprise uh, economists and forecasters. And we saw their economic update um, or outlook for the year increase quite significantly after over the last number of years. So for uh, 2024, its GDP is expected to increase by about 2.6%. And the US is an important one to look at, and I always highlight it because the Irish economy has actually tracked a little bit more closely so, to some of the indicators in the US than what it has to our European counterparts. Um, and we'll I'll highlight some of those as we go through the, the Irish statistics in a, in a little while. Um, as I said, the US is shining light. China on paper has shown 
shown quite a, a high level of growth when we look at solely GDP. But of course, beyond that GDP figure, there is an awful lot of concern. Um, and that is rooted in a number of different areas. One is real estate performance, um, a sector under considerable strain. Uh, it, the strength of its labour market and certainly the youth unemployment there as well. Um, and also, therefore, that's translating into its domestic demand as well. That hasn't seen that same level of bounce that we would have expected pre-COVID or that we have certainly experienced in other parts of the world. And then lastly, Europe kind of sits in the middle of the two of those, where in contrast to the US, where we have seen increases in that those economic outlooks, Europe has struggled a lot more and it's struggled to regain some of its growth. And a large part of that is if we look at the most largest economy set within Europe is Germany. Um, has seen quite a significant contraction over last year. And I suppose high uh, energy costs have been a large impact or a factor leading into that and impacting those kind of high energy intensive sectors in your manufacturing. Um, but overall, despite that, those regional divergences, I think the key takeaway is that we've still seen a performance that is better than what many people would have anticipated. But of course, I don't live in the clouds. I know that there are stark realities out there. And if we go to the next slide, please, Ruth, continually in these economic forecasts, we see wording relating to the risks and that uh, the balance or that risks are tilted to the downside. Now, some of that wording has actually changed over the past six months. And you'll see here at the top of the slide, I have that overall risks are becoming more better balanced. And in one way, I suppose that quite can be quite difficult to get our heads around, particularly when we put into context the increase in that heightened geopolitical tensions across the world in the past year. But what we've seen originally started in um, Ukraine with the Russian invasion, but also now more so in the Middle East. But I think why that we're getting that commentary of more balanced uh, risks to what would have been there maybe potentially a year ago is because of that inflation projection. We have seen inflation uh, pull back from where it was at a faster rate than many people would have anticipated. We saw the very first uh, interest rate cut take place in the ECB as of June 6th. We're yet to see that call take place in, in the US and in the UK, even though we have very positive UK inflation data out only yesterday evening or this morning, I'm getting confused with my days. Um, and we haven't seen a huge reaction to it yet in terms of um, financial market fallouts, or certainly not to the degree that some people may have anticipated. Of course, we're not out of the woods with all of these risks just yet. And so they continue to be the risks that we are looking at. But that's why I think we're beginning to see some of that better balanced commentary come out and, and that pullback from a strong narrative of risks are very much so tilted to the downside. And if we move to the next slide, as I said, that heightened geopolitical uncertainty is really, I think, where a lot of that risks uh, commentary or forecast lies at the moment. And I suppose that is not surprising. As I said, we've quite a lot of conflict in the world. And we do see that come through, whether it's in that geopolitical risk index, which I have on the chart here on the slide. We've seen some bit of movement, of course, in crude oil prices and also in shipping costs. And the reason, again, why we monitor these is, for example, the OECD have suggested that if we have a doubling in your shipping costs, a consistent doubling in your shipping costs, that would eventually pass through into an increase in our CPI or our inflation of about 0.4%. And that's after quite a, a significant battle to try and get that inflation back in track. And I suppose the reason for that is that we know that the Red Sea accounts for about 15% uh, of your global maritime trade volumes in, in 2022. And we have seen a movement or a movement away in, in, in some of the, the shipping through that route. But we also know that has the, the conflict and the difficulties within that route has added about 30 to 50% of an increase on the journey, tra journey time in, in goods coming through that route. And it has input impacted the production in, in schedules in Europe, uh, particularly in some of its car manufacturing as well. So I, I, I don't want to harbour on about it too much. We all know the risks that are there, but I suppose that is a, 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 we have a number of indicators where we can see it coming through. 
And lastly, if we move again to the next slide, is when we talk about geopolitical risks. And this is why I'm delighted that we have France here, so I'm not going to dwell on this slide. But that obviously we know we're in a year, the year of election, as it has been coined, where we've many different nations that are due to go to the polls. Some already, we had our European elections only on June 7th, that I know France will go into in huge detail. And we continue to see um, at changes in our political landscape. France, for example, now being brought forward in their uh, with with the, the the fallout of the European elections, there we have uh, the United Kingdom obviously calling their snap election in July of this year. United States for November, and of course we're still waiting within Ireland to have a general election called as well. Despite many changes in 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 party leaders over the past number of months called as well, and only yesterday the the leader of the Green Party stepping down too. So our global economic context or that macro context outside of Ireland is quite volatile. It has upheld better than what many would have expected, but there are still risks there. So if we bring it down to Ireland and we move on to maybe two slides ahead, uh, pre please, Ruth. So and we look at Ireland and well, what has happened from an Irish context. And as I said, that we performed almost similarly to what we saw in the States. And I know you're going to call me out straight away and say, well, that's not what we're seeing in the table on the right hand side where you have a GDP decline in 2023. And I suppose within that Irish context, we know that GDP is incredibly volatile within Ireland due to that large multinational side to our economy. So, yes, we did have a decline in GDP in 2023, but where we didn't see a decline was more so in your personal um, consumption and modified domestic demand, which can be a little bit uh, tricky at times as well. But as I said, that decline in your GDP was heavily influenced by the multinational side of the economy. And you can see on the right hand side of the slide where I put a, a chart looking at foreign and domestic GVA. So not quite GDP, but it gives you an idea as to the level of impact by both our domestic and our foreign side of the economy. And what I really want you to look at here is those blue lines um, for your foreign owned m and &E, and look at there for 2020 and 2021 and all the way through to 2022. And you'll see that we experience exceptional level of growth within that part of our economy um, during the COVID era. And that's what led to Ireland having significant levels of GDP growth that stood out on a global stage during those COVID years of a growth rate of even 12, over 12% 12 um, in, in 2021. Uh, but that foreign side of our economy, it's very much so influenced by pharma and by tech and by our manufacturing sectors and even within that a contract manufacturing sector. The good news, I suppose, is that, that domestic side of the economy that did decline last year, its first contraction since 2013, is expected to return to growth in 2024 and 2025, while the domestic economy is expected to continue to see growth this year as well. So what I really take from this is that that was almost a rebalancing or a... a con, uh, a, a rebalancing of that exceptional level of growth that was experienced within that pharma and those tech sectors during the COVID era. And again, I suppose to, to highlight that picture a bit more, if we move to the next slide, please, uh, Ruth, I have it here for your goods exports. And I think this again really highlights that exceptional, exceptional level of growth in your chemical and your pharma exports. So you'll see there in what that shade of green box that I have for an annual monthly graph. So that's why there's a bit of volatility in there. And I don't usually show monthly indices for this. But I think, again, it's very important because it shows that exceptional level of growth in 2022, but also that normalization period in 2023 and the beginning of the rebound in it at the start of 2024. Um, so overall, our exports declined by about 4.8% last year, but they are expected to increase this year um, back to a level of about over 3% in line with where our personal consumption is meant to be for 2024. Um, and also where we continue to see a growth in modified domestic demand for 2024 as well. So if we move to the next slide, moving away from where I think I made it quite clear that that contraction on a GDP basis is very much so led by that multinational side of our economy and largely the exports, your exports in your pharma and your ICT, while our domestic side of the economy performed quite well. 
And if we now look at instead some of the, our tax return receipts, and the reason why I've actually put this in here quite early is because it's often a question that I get asked the most when doing presentations or insight sessions to clients, because we all know Ireland has quite a competitive corporation tax rate. And we also know that we're reliant therefore on a number of companies feeding into that corporation tax rate. But let's start with the left hand side of the slide first and where we look at total tax receipts on a 12 month rolling basis up as far as May 2024 this year. So our most recent available data and you'll see in here not only have we seen that increase in your corporation tax rate but also within your income tax and your VAT and I suppose they're more reflective of our labour market and our continuing consumer who continues to 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 spend um, despite that high inflationary period and also an increase in your 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 interest rates and we get to both of those at labour market and your consumer in the next slide but I did want to highlight that that, that increase in those tax receipts are not solely reliant on corporation tax. We also see them within income tax and VAT. But of course, we cannot deny that breakdown if we look at our breakdown of where total tax returns come from both those multinational side of the um, economy or those large firms and the other firms. And if we look at it, we see, let's look at the, the corporation tax rate, one on the, the far kind of left hand side of that chart. And we say that about 10 firms accounted for more than half of all corporation tax receipts in 2022 within Ireland. And of course, that does place risks within it. Remember also that our corporate and tax receipts within Ireland have more than doubled from 2019 up to 2022. And I'm talking about 2022 because the specific breakdown between the different firms is not available for 2023 yet. Um, and the reason I suppose why we highlight that is because, yes, when we know that we have further geopolitical risks or macroeconomic risks and fragmentation and we know that a portion of our a significant portion of our corporation tax receipts are reliant on firms or international firms that does pose some risk to the Irish economy but what I would say is I suppose that government have planned for this we have spoken about those windfall tax for quite a number of years within Ireland and action was taken for that within budget 2024. So I spoke about that income tax and that VAT rate and how where they are coming from, the increases within them, and it's reflective of a strong labour market and a strong consumer. So if we move to the next slide, please. Here, this is where we see this. So let's start, first of all, with our labour market. And you'll see there on the left hand side, that figure of 2.7 million. So that is the number of persons employed within the Irish economy as of Q1 2024. And is it is a record rate of employment within the, the economy economy. We've continued to see significant growth rates within our labour market or the volume of persons employed within Ireland over the past number of years, despite the upheaval of COVID-19. And that has fed into, I suppose, that unemployment rate remaining relatively stable and close to historic lows. So it sits at just over 4% at the moment. Um, you might have seen there were a lot of headlines in the last um, maybe it was two or three weeks ago at this stage, looking or speaking about that Q1 2024 unemploy or employment rate figure. And it's because it was the slowest annual pace of increase that we've had for quite some time since 2021. We saw an additional 59,000 persons employed in the 12 months to April 2024, compared to over 81,000 persons in the same time period last year. Um, but what I would say to that is I think that some of that comment commentary, negative commentary was a little bit harsh and unfair. We cannot continue to ex uh, ex expect the same level of employment growth as what we had seen for the past two years, because that did continue to beat expectations every single time. When we also are operating at a very tight labour market of an unemployment rate of close to 4% <coughs> as well, where those additional employment numbers are coming from becomes a lot more strained. Um, but also a positive within that is that we saw a reduction in the level of long term persons unemployed. And that's a very important indicator because that's that element that is much more difficult for economies to improve on. And it certainly does have a weighing on our balance sheets. Um, 
I also wanted to highlight on the right hand side here, you have employment by sector. And the reason, again, why I've put this here, I suppose, is because, again, if we look at some headlines that we've had over the past number of years, that yes, there has been a pullback in that ICT or your tech sector. And Ireland has not been immune to that. We have seen a significant number of redundancies announced within certain firms. But I suppose what I wanted to highlight within that graph is that we are still, despite that, those. Uh, redundancies continuing to see growth within our, our tech sector from an employment perspective. And that graph shows you the increase from Q1 2019 up to Q1 2024 where you'll see the ICT sector is up 47% in terms of its, its total number of persons employed within that sector um, since 2019 or since pre-COVID times. The other areas that have seen significant levels of growth are obviously your professional services and your public admin. Um, and I think that ICT sector and your professional services are, do continue to drive a lot of the economy in the year ahead as well. If we move to the next slide then, and this is where I get into, I suppose, a little bit of that consumer um, part of it, and also looking at our, our CPI, so our inflation level. So like everywhere else in the world, inflation within Ireland has seen a significant increase over the past uh, number of years during the, initially during the post or during COVID, um, when we saw, we would have seen significant supply side shocks yeah. take place. And then obviously when we saw that significant increase to energy crops costs take place across Europe, Ireland was not immune to it. But what we have seen, I think, is that reduction in your CPI within Ireland has, has continued quite in line with what we've seen within Europe. So as of May 2024, our most recent data period, that inflation sits about 2.6%. And that's a long distance off from the peak of about 9.2% in October 2022. And um, but what I really want to highlight, I suppose, is then if we look at the right hand side of that slide and I give you our savings ratio and this feeds back to that strong domestic consumer that I spoke about a number of slides ago and again relates to that, the US economy. So despite our increase in our interest rates and our inflation, we've continued to see quite a strong consumer within Ireland. Retail sales have not taken the dip or consumer spending has not taken the dip that many people would have anticipated. As I said, that personal consumption figure is expected to be over 2% this year. Um, but we've also continued to see quite a high savings ratio. And you'll see the most recent figure we have is for 2024 Q1 at 14.7%. And that's still higher than the savings ratio than what what we had uh, pre-COVID that sat just below the 10% mark is about 9.5%. It obviously increased significantly during the early ages, stages of COVID and Ireland had one of the highest savings rates in Europe, the highest savings rate for one quarter during 2020. Um, and that has led to significant amount of household deposits uh, with it reaching 152 billion as of December 2023. Uh, put that figure aside and to give you a bit more context of it, that figure for the end of December 2023, it sat 38% higher than December 2019. So there's 38% more household deposits sitting in the banks at the end of 2023 than what there was at 2019. And I think that's important because it gives that little bit of a buffer. And I suppose there's a reason why we've continued to see that strong level of consumer spending despite high cost of living and high interest rates. And that's where Ireland differs a little bit to the US. In the US, we've seen similar to Ireland where a strong labour market and a very strong active consumer has led to that upswing in its, in its economic performance over the last two years that most people didn't expect. But in contrast to, to, to the US, if you were to place the US savings ratio against the Irish one here, we see that US savings ratio has fallen right back. Mm. It's now lower than what it was pre-COVID, but it's it's about 4%. So US consumers are dipping into those savings. The savings are fueling that economic activity. And we have seen an impact on some credit cards um, and, and repayment of loans within the US that we also haven't seen here within Ireland. So it is that one contrast and it's the consumer and the labour market is driving growth, but the consumer within Ireland is not dipping into its savings to do so. 
I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to slip on to have two more slides left. I'm going to tip on this last, second last one very quickly before I tie up with the, the last one that I think feeds into Fran or give him a good introduction. Um, so as I said, that labour market or the labour market continues to be strong and our domestic consumer continues to uphold quite well as well. But of course, there has to be some impact from your higher interest rates within the Irish economy. Um, and when we look to this, we often look at mortgage approvals and your house, house market to prices to see where are we beginning to see this impact. And I suppose, yes, there is an impact of it. And I cast your eye or, or ask you to bring your eye to the mover purchaser column or grouping of, of charts here within that, that group. It's the second one in from the left hand side. And this is where we are beginning to see a decline in your mover purchasers. So there are people who already own homes and are looking to either trade up or trade down. And I do think interest rates are, are a big reason for that decline in the level of mortgage approvals and mortgage drawdowns for that particular sector. First time buyers are a whole other kettle of fish and you'll see the increase within those first time buyer cohort um, within the, the far left hand side of the chart. And I'll go into that in more detail if people have questions on it or want to ask at the end or want to contact me afterwards. But if we go to the very last slide and I look at here and this is, I suppose, of OK, we know we have a, a strong Irish economy on paper. We're seeing a rebound in that GDP figure this year, but placing GDP to the side, personal consumption, modified domestic demand, which are the indicators that strip out that volatile multinational side of the Irish economy are also expected to continue to, for, to perform well. But what are the topics we need to think of when moving forward for Ireland's continued growth? And this is where I think some of our success also plays against us. We have very strong population growth and that combined with a strong economy is leading to significant pressures on our infrastructure. And that is across both housing, transport, healthcare, education and a significant level of investment, both at a state level, but also from multinational uh, capital is required within the economy to, to meet that infrastructure deficit that is there. We also need to address the green transition, digital transformation, and some social issues that are emerging from those demographic pressures that are there. And the reason why I put these on the slide here with the, the share of the local elections on the left-hand side is because these were some of the key topics for our elections here within Ireland that took place for both the Europeans and our local elections on June 7th. And I've no doubt will continue to be topics of, of interest when we move to our local or our general election whenever that date is called, because these are the topics that are very important for our growth moving forward. And with that, I'm gone slightly over time, so I'll pass over to, to Franz, and I look forward to hearing your, your digest. Well, uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, that was quite a, an impressive overview. And if you allow me, I will go now to the externalities, the unpredictables, the ones we, in, in my diplomatic trade, we call events, which can upset anything, as history proves. First of all, the European Union, the European elections. Then I would like to say a couple of words on the American elections uh, and then on the relations with China. And if I have a minute left, I will say a couple of things about Putin and Russia. Um, the European election uh, didn't, I mean, the distribution of power within the European Parliament essentially remained what it was, even to the point where the Christian Democrats gained some seats, which was not expected. The only lo real loser of uh, the European elections are the liberals. And the li we, who says liberals in Europe says Macron, and Macron finds the same problem back in his home country, where he tries now to prevent him, to avoid from becoming a lame duck president, and uh, that's the reason why he called for election, which is a gamble. But essentially, the distribution of power did not change dramatically, save a bit for the liberals. But secondly, that should not make us forget that all European parties, or practically all, uh, leave out the Greens, that the, uh, a number of European parties have been the whole political landscape, uh, landscape has been shifting to the right, which is an important factor for what I'll come to a bit later on, on future policies of the European Union. 
then as far as the elections uh, and the and as far as the elections are concerned and the effects it has on the uh, appointment for top jobs in the European Union. Well, they had their little fights and their little games uh, Friday, uh, Monday last, and they will have them again at the end of next week. But essentially, uh, the package, uh, which is the most probable as a come out, looks like follows Ursula von der Leyen returning to the Commission, uh, Polish, uh, the Portuguese Prime Minister da Costa becoming uh, su the, the successor of Charles Michel as a president of the European Council. And then for the Liberals, uh, it may be Callas uh, as a, but that's less certain, uh, she may become the next, um, uh, the next <clears throat> high representative. Why these three? Well, because traditionally the coalition, the majority coalition is made of the Christian Democrats, the Socialists and the Liberals. And there are a number of, of uh, um, a number of footnotes um, at the meeting uh, last Monday, the Christian Democrats got themselves into trouble with the unnecessarily so with the socialists saying that they would only confirm Da Costa for two years and a half and not for five years which upset the or socialist friends Mel Meloni felt excluded from the to and fro from the, the negotiations uh, and uh, for her that is of course an essential point because she has, she has succeeded and it's part of her success story in, in Italy she has succeeded in putting Italy back on the uh, European map and uh, she doesn't want to uh, get uh, want to this uh, advantage uh, she has uh, gained to be withered away by political games in the margin of the European Council. But essentially, the um, package looks quite uh, probable, the one, uh, the one I said. That is, <clears throat> that is for the appointment of a new leadership. As far as policies, future policies are concerned, Always keep in mind that the whole of the, the landscape in Europe has shifted at the European level, but as well at the national level to the right, and that will impact a number of policies. I'll mention, uh, for instance, defense will become very much uh, a prominent issue, it has to do with the wars on our borders. Climate, uh, I mean the mise en oeuvre of the, uh, the <clears throat> of the, the, the climate pact uh, will be more difficult than we thought. Uh, I think it's all, <coughs> everything is still very much uh, on the rule book, but there will be many, many fights around climate in the, in the coming years. Um, the, as far as regulation is concerned, there will be more increased resistance against overregulation. That is as well part of a shift to to the right. Um, the uh, internal market, uh, the discussion about internal market will be constructed around the letter report, which is a great reading. It's a great report. But uh, basically, the letter report tries to extend the benefit of the internal market to to fields not yet covered. And essentially, uh, two are, of them are essential. Uh, Letta has been talking about the internal market for, uh, for financial uh, products and services, where indeed a lot of work has to be done. And secondly, uh, uh, the so what he calls the social internal market, it's uh, uh, about stuff like the, the, the portability of social rights from one country to another. All this is eminent, obvious, we should do that because it translates in higher growth and higher productivity, but don't uh, underestimate the popular resistance against many of the, the things which uh, Letta, uh, Letta proposed. Uh, so, well, it will be uh, an interesting issue, but the, the obstacles are bigger than some people seem to think. Enlargement, as enlargement processes are uh, processes of seven, eight years at least, 
I think the tendency uh, in the next European uh, Council and in the European Parliament will be to kick enlargement uh, rather more into the large, uh, into the long grass. The reason being that uh, so many governments are afraid of their own electorate and they know that enlargement is one of the least popular causes in, in Europe. Uh, at least in, in, in the more popular uh, populist part of public opinion. That is in a few words uh, what will happen as far in the short term with the appointment of the, le of the new leadership. And that is what will happen in terms of policy making in the next few years. Now, um, a, a few words on the United States. I'm still very much in contact with a, a number of American friends over there. In the past, they used to say, well, in the end, Biden is going to win. Nobody today, nobody knows. And uh, people see that uh, the trial in Manhattan, scandal so-and-so, don't have any effect on the popularity of, uh, of uh, Trump. Uh, nobody hazards to predict the outcome, the more so that in the American system, it will depend on a couple of hundred thousands of votes spread over five swing states. Uh, but we should all, be, uh, and I think most governments on the Euro uh, in Europe do so, uh, aware that the possibility of Trump winning this election is not to be excluded. Now, what has that as... Uh, as a consequence, um, I think I take the hypothesis that uh, Trump wins the election. Uh, I think once again his uh, bark will be worse than his bite. There will be a lot of shouting, uh, but uh, I don't see him. Even if he says so, I don't see him leaving NATO, for instance. Uh, and we should not forget that with um, with Trump. A number of bipartisan policies will survive. The one on protectionism, the whole, I mean, in the past, the Democrats were protectionists and the Republicans were free traders. Nowadays, the majority of the Republican Party has become uh, protectionist and uh, neither Biden nor Trump will hesitate to impose protectionist measures at the detriment of the European Union. Uh, we should not forget that. Uh, the other issue, uh, geopolitical issue on which they basically agree on, which there is uh, bipartisanship in a way is China. And that may rattle us if the Americans go too far in, uh, <clears throat> go too far in China, which may be well, well the case. So outcome uncertain. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there will still be uh, uh, some policies which are important to our company and which will not change whether you have Biden or Trump. A few words on, 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 uh, on China, if I may. Chinese economy for the moment is weaker than it used to be. You see that in all the figures on, on uh, youth unemployment. And the, the, the problem is, is that they don't succeed. The transition are still not successful in transiting from an export-driven economy to a consumption-driven economy. And uh, the Chinese are perfectly aware on the fact that they are there in a tight spot. And as they know they are in a tight spot, they know there are limits to what they can do or not do uh, internationally, geopolitically. Which brings me to uh, EU and US attitude vis-a-vis -vis China. I think the, the tendency, the, the differ differentiation between EU policy and US policy is rather increasing. I, it's still the old uh, phrase of decoupling versus de-risking. Uh, we have our own uh, kind of game, uh, kind of tensions with, uh, with the Chinese. Uh, think about uh, the state subsidy action the commission took uh, on electric vehicles and uh, the 
the um, retort of the Chinese about uh, pork meat. But hey, stay there. Why pork meat? Why not German uh, luxury cars? So you see the, the, uh, the Chinese are uh, subtle and sophisticated enough to try and limit action and reaction. So basically, yes, we have our problems with, uh, with the Chinese and we will have other problems with the Chinese, but uh, both the Chinese and the Europeans will shrink away from a full, uh, full range trade war. It's a, a policy of controlled, um, of controlled uh, pinpoints and uh, that is where we are different from the Chinese, the, from the Americans, where the political dynamics are such that they may go further vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China uh, in terms of their of Chinese exports in uh, under the cover of technology and so on. Uh, what worries me is that the American policy vis-a-vis -vis China looks much less under control than all policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. And this may, of course, impact a lot of the global economy and as a, a consequence, uh, a lot of the work uh, uh, Deloitte is uh, doing. That for the, um, for the Chinese, the, my last point, and I'll <clears throat> leave it at that, is a word about Russia. Russia, we may have not noticed it, but Russia just came through elections. Uh, Putin was re-elected for the fifth time as president of uh, Russia. And uh, he, he, not, he did not even need to manipulate the electoral outcomes. He, re, he is and remains by all standards, rather popular and perfectly capable uh, winning in a democratic uh, election. And so uh, you see that uh, he feels quite in, in power and uh, he is there to stay. He has, of course, this problem in Ukraine, but there again, given his popularity, given the vast resources of, uh, uh, of Russia, given the, the, the stability of the Russian public opinion, I mean, Putin can sit it out for a long time. And in a way, I'm thinking that time is playing to his advantage. Uh, um, and uh, if... Uh, uh, this develops into a stalemate. He will live with the stalemate and a, and a frozen uh, conflict. The effects of uh, Russia's behavior on our economy, we had to stomach that at the beginning of the war. But I think these effects have been absorbed and uh, that uh, uh, and don't look liable for uh, for repetition. So the or Russian. Uh, uh, partners uh, uh, will uh, will remain. Of course, we have to keep them at a distance and uh, we will have a frozen conflict, but nothing which I don't think that uh, this conflict uh, could uh, run uh, out of control. Uh, yes, sometimes they are talking about the nuclear factor, but nobody <laughs> thinks that they really mean that. That's just posturing. And so we will. We are confronted to have a Russia of the type of Putin, governed by Putin or uh, a successor, which will remain for the Europeans an important factor, more or less under control. But the, 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 this whole idea of trying to incorporate Russia into Western structures has failed. And that's more or less the situation where we are, and it will look like like 19th century, uh, 19th century foreign policy and diplomacy. Voila. Thank you so much, Franz, and uh, thank you, Kate. Um, I'm just going to have to triage our way through uh, the questions. We have some very interesting questions that have come in from the participants. So um, I'm going to 
try and get to as many of them as we can in um, the couple of minutes that we do have left. Um, can I ask uh, Kate first one of the questions that we got? We saw a recent uh, report in the last couple of days, which is that, that Irish um, housing target should be uh, 50,000 units per annum up from a previous of, of 33,000 units. Uh, or 33,000. Could, could you tell us, Kate, the questioner asks, um, how we would go about building um, this number of houses? I think, Declan, first of all, we've seen a number of reports in the last few days. There was even only another one out uh, <coughs> yesterday with that figure much higher at 85,000. Um, and the 50,000 has come from that exercise that the Department of Finance did looking at, well, how much is it going to cost um, what's the level of capital that would be required to deliver those units? Because it is quite a significant increase from 33,000 up to 40,000 was one of the scenarios, 55 another. Um, and in reality, I'm actually still waiting to get the ESRI um, updated population forecasts that are due at the end of June. So hoping in the next week or so where we will get very concrete um, numbers as to what is that going to be set as a new annual target. Um, and I think what we see from that is that there is a significant increase in the level of capital that is required. And I think the breakdown of that capital is, that is required is very important. And it's it's good to see the commentary change on this in more recent times, be it from the Department of Finance report that was released um, yesterday, or indeed from the Housing Commission report, which was released uh, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago at this stage as well. A lot happens in housing. It's hard to keep tra track of the weeks. But what do we see from this? Well, we see in order to get to that over 50,000 uh, homes per annum figure that we need capital of over 20 billion. Um, where do we sit today? Well, they say that the, the volume of capital that was inputted from both private and, and public sector uh, spending for in order to reach 2022 volumes, which was over 29,000, sat at about 13 billion. So that is quite a journey that is required. I think what's significant within that is both the Housing Commission report and the Department of Finance have stated that the predominant capital source for that is international. It is not state. Um, about 16 billion of the over 20 billion required to deliver that over 50,000 units is from private capital. And of that private capital, the large proportion is to be or international funds. And I think that is critical in all policy and particularly when we're looking at budget 2025 as well, to ensure that we are providing an environment that has stable and consistent policy that allows investment decisions to take place. Um, we cannot deliver that volume of, of, of housing without having that international capital. And I think, and I know Declan, we've spoken about this a number of times as well, is that the housing delivered is just one element of it. What is the offspin that's required to therefore then cater for all that population as well? It's the infrastructure that's required beforehand from roads to water to also schools, education, healthcare around those new households being formed as well, um, which we don't have figures for yet. So that 20 billion is solely for housing. It is not for all the other infrastructure requirements as well that I would have outlined on that last slide. Thanks, Kate. That's really interesting. And I think probably one of the points to bring out in that is that's 20 billion a year every year. Every year. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Franz, I have a really interesting question here um, from a participant that is asking about, in your experience, um, the last couple of years seem, it, it's a hackneyed phrase to say it's been characterized by volatility. But as we you as we move to a multipolar world and we see, for example, coming out of Switzerland at the weekend, we see um, a, a number of countries that are still trading with Russia asserting their influence on on the declaration by not signing that particular declaration uh, relating to to Ukraine. Um, how where would you put that volatility um, uh, in your experiences? Everyone thinks we're living in very unstable times. What do you think, Franz? Are we living in very unstable times? Well, um, uh, we have lived 
many, many years in the past in a predictable system, bipolar, two rivals, but perfectly predictable one to the other. And that was in itself was a guarantee of stability. When both poles uh, being uh, Washington and Moscow disappeared, then it was a free for all and anything was happening at the time. And uh, uh, that uh, terrorism happened, the rise of China and, uh, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, we are basically in a system which is quite open and unpredictable, but people are trying to reposition themselves uh, and uh, I think a, a very important factor, but I don't know whether we will get there, if we succeed in in uh, in staying together with the Americans, then uh, at least on the Western side, the critical mass will have been reached and we will become, again, a polar uh, a pole of stability, constructed differently, the rapport de force between the Europeans and the Americans may, may, be, may shift a little bit, but essentially that might happen uh, and uh, the question then is, uh, uh, can it happen with Trump? Question, I don't have an answer to. Um, uh, but th that is certainly one parameter I would keep an eye on. The second parameter is, uh, is of course, is China. And as I said in my introductory remarks, the Chinese are perfectly aware of their strengths, but they are perfectly aware of their weaknesses as well. And for them, the for them looking at it from Beijing, uh, who is unpredictable? It's not the Europeans. They know perfectly their way around, as we know our way around of dealing with all these kinds of frictions and different difference of interest between China and the European Union. Their parameter of unpredictability is, of course, the United States. And I'm I think that they are following American politics uh, at very very close quarters. But as long as that relationship uh, between China and the West uh, uh, has not stable, then you remain in an unstable, uh, to use a hang night phrase. Uh, um, but in this situation of unpredictability, instability, uh, which may in the coming years become uh, become better in the sense that more stability may, may be generated. As long as we are where we are now, I mean, uh, uh, it's a free for all. Look at Iran, look at Turkey, look at uh, South Africa, look at the couple of things happening in Latin America. I mean, uh, the, the uh, every uh, so many medium-sized powers feel that uh, it's their moment or never, and they can be at the basis at, uh, of a very... Uh, very dangerous zones of conflicts of their, their own making. Voilà. Thank you, Franz. And just one, one very brief supplementary, um, uh, if we could just on that, um, a number of participants here are members of boards or uh, um, in the process of moving towards that stage in their career. And we've two particular questions just about um, green policy and sustainability. Um, I think a lot of momentum over the last couple of years. Do you see that momentum dissipating or where do you see it landing in the next five years? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> An easy question and I'll give you a minute yeah, for yeah, it as yeah, well. Yeah, we will miss all the deadlines. Okay. But to miss deadlines is something quite different from there being no deadlines at all. I think popular resistance, uh, government resistance, uh, some countries uh, uh, will resist very more. A number of the things we have decided we would be doing, I think they are still on the charge. They still will be done, but the timeline, I'm not so sure about. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, Kate, just like that last question to Franz was a very fair one. I have an equally fair one for you, just to conclude. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, uh, Predictably enough, uh, interest rates and interest rate policy. Um, I think we've seen the start of unwinding just in a minute. Where do you see it going for the next uh, 12 months? Yeah, so we saw the first rate cut, obviously, by the ECB announced on June 6th, much anticipated. It didn't lead to any surprise that they they did finally go with that on, this, on the 6th. And interestingly as well, we saw that all council members bar one 
had voted for it. Um, I think where the next goes is very, very difficult. And again, this is where Madame Christine Lagarde um, and also our own Philip Lane were very cautious and staying with the exact same commentary for both of them in any in any press releases or any interviews that they have done since. And they're very adamant that it will be driven meeting by meeting and by data. They're looking at three particular sources now for that data. They are confident that their inflation is coming down and that they, uh, it will not be a linear path, so they're not going to get spooked if we see one or two months where there's a high inflation rate. Uh, but we're now looking to wage growth and we're looking to the absorption of wage growth by companies. So what will levels of profits be like? They do not want to see a straight pass through of that wage growth growth back into the economy in terms of higher costs. Um, I, I would be a little bit cautious of how many more rate cuts we're going to have from the ECB this year. I think you could potentially see one, but they are giving no word around when or when uh, when or whether or not they will definitely do that. I think the states is the one that probably has confused or surprised many people. Markets were anticipating we'd have a rise, some as bullish or as early as April of this year, which I was never on board with. I could not see that coming. Um, and that date for the states or the Fed doing their first cut has continued to be pushed back. I think many um, economists and markets are now expecting that that could potentially happen in September. But if you see your first rate cut in the states in September, we're not on for a huge or a significant amount of them this year either. Um, so I think it's still a very uncertain path and the first rate cut is the easiest and it's what comes after that is actually much harder. Thanks, Kate. And I think that's a beautiful segue uh, tying economics into politics. If we have the first rate cut in September and the Fed going into going into the, the election uh, over there in the States, which you know, we'll be keenly watching, <coughs> will keep us warm throughout the winter, I'm sure, with speculation. Um, so uh, it just falls to me to give uh, um, a heartfelt thanks to both Franz and, 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 and to Kate for their time and their contribution this morning. I know that there's a recording going to be available for uh, course participants uh, of this, but um, thank you both. I think uh, the pace at which things are happening in our respect in your respective um, genres is such that we could actually have this call in a week's time and probably <laughs> talk about a number of different issues. <laughs> so uh, um, it's been fascinating. It's a pleasure to work with you both. And I hope um, this has been of use to the participants on the course. So thank you all. Take care. Have a good morning, everybody. Thank you. See you. Bye.